Good evening, all of you. Am I audible and visible? If I'm audible and visible, can I get a thumbs up on the light chat, please? Yeah. So, uh, if you're joining the session for the first time, uh, this is Dr. Shanmuga Priya, your prep planner faculty for biochemistry. And uh, this is a session which is on a NEET PG biochemistry marathon. So, in this session, I have chosen few MCQs, few high yield MCQs, using which I'll be discussing few facts and concepts. And if you attend this session, my assurance to you is at the end of the session, you would have learned uh, many facts and you would have understood many concepts so that you will not have to blindly answer any MCQ. Okay. So this will be a conceptual discussion. Thank you, all of you. Hi, good evening, Cheese. Uh, good evening, Ramanand. Hi, baby. Uh, the volume is not enough. This happens every time. Am I audible now? Is it audible? Okay. So, uh, let's start the session now. This is the first MCQ for you all. Uh, the question is a 44 year old, good evening Malay, a 44 year old male presents with yellowish discoloration of pharma creases. So do you see that here, yellowish discoloration of pharma creases. His lipid profile is serum cholesterol is, uh, thank you all of you, good evening MS. His serum cholesterol is 440 milligram per deciliter, his triglyceride is 380 milligram per deciliter. The probable cause is, so if you look at the history alone, yes, tell me the right answer all of you. Many of you are answering it as choice B. Dr. Sarika says it's choice C. Uh, choice, yes. Good, all of you. I'm happy that all of you are attempting. Yeah. So let's try to understand from the question the lipid profile. What do you observe here? There is an elevation of cholesterol, right? What is a normal serum cholesterol? Normal serum cholesterol is 200 milligram per deciliter. In this case, serum cholesterol level is elevated. Similarly, look at triglyceride. Normal triglyceride is expected to be less than 150 milligram per deciliter. That is also elevated. So this is a case when there is an elevation of both cholesterol and triglyceride. It's a mixed dyslipidemia. That is clue number one. And the clue number two that is given to you is pharma creases being discolored yellow. Okay. So what would be a right answer? Your right answer will be choice C, APO E2, E2 genotype. So whenever you see yellowish discoloration of pharma creases, there is a term to define it and that is xanthoma palmaris triae. So tell me what is it? How do you define it? This is called the xanthoma palmaris triae and that is pethagnomonic of type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. And type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia is caused by APO E defect. Don't you think that 3 and E sound similar? Type 3 and E, they sound similar, right? So type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia is caused by a defect of APO E. The normal allele that all of us have is E3 allele. Because of a mutation, E3 is replaced by E2. And if a person has got homozygous APO E2, then the affinity of these receptors, the affinity of these lipoproteins for their receptors is very low. Now which lipoprotein has got APO E? It's a remnant APO protein. Because remnant APO protein has got very low affinity for the receptors, remnants will not be cleared off from the circulation. So we call this disease as a remnant disease. Okay, so what is the right answer here? You should know that xanthoma palmaris tri is pethagnomonic for which condition? It is pethagnomonic for type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia, which is caused by APO E defect. It is E2 E2 homozygous condition. Very good, yes. It is also called this familial dis-beta lipoproteinemia. Very good, Samjit. So the right answer here is E2, E2 genotype. But at this point of time, I want you all to know that this type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia also has got another pethagnomonic condition that is palmar eruptive xanthomas. Eruptive xanthomas can be present anywhere. But if eruptive xanthomas are present in the palm, palma eruptive xanthomas pethagnomonic for type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. So now I am going to tell you few facts about type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia which can be asked as MCQs. What is the first fact about type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia? It is caused by which defect all of you? 3 and E sound similar so it is APO E defect. 
okay and apo is an apo protein of remnant lipoproteins in this condition remnant lipoproteins accumulate so we call this condition as remnant disease and remnants carry both cholesterol and triglycerides so in this condition there is an elevation of both cholesterol and tgl so all of you take this from me whenever you are asked to make a diagnosis of hyperlipoproteinemia the first fact that you should check is whether there is an elevation of only cholesterol or is there is there an elevation of only triglyceride or is there an elevation of both cholesterol and triglyceride so tell me what will you call it as or what are the conditions that you will suspect when there is an elevation of only cholesterol tell me the answer when there is an elevation of only cholesterol what will be a suspicion your suspicion should be type 2a hyperlipoproteinemia that is why type 2a is otherwise called as familial hypercholesterolemia so if you see a person presenting with only an elevation of cholesterol then what should be a suspicion type 2a which is familial hypercholesterolemia and this is caused by the defect of ldl receptor isn't that logical when ldl receptor is defective ldl cannot be cleared off from the circulation so ldl stays back in the circulation ldl carries cholesterol that is why the condition is called as familial hypercholesterolemia whereas if there is an elevation of only triglyceride what will be a suspicion all of you only triglyceride elevation then you should suspect three conditions okay type 1 type 4 and type 5 So, what are the three conditions when there is only an elevation of TGL? Type one, type four, and type five. What if there is an elevation of both cholesterol and triglyceride? If there is an elevation of both cholesterol and triglyceride, what is left out? Left out will be type two B and type three. Okay, type two B and type three. So, do you remember in this history there was an elevation of both cholesterol and triglyceride? So, what are your suspicions? It can be type two B or type three. In this case, because you see Palmer uh, xanthoma palmaris trie, you know it is type three hyperlipoproteinemia. So, elevation of both cholesterol and triglyceride. And apart from this, there will be an abnormality on lipoprotein electrophoresis in this condition. and that is why this condition is called as broad beta disease i will be discussing about lipoprotein electrophoresis in another 5 to 10 minutes then i'll help you understand how to make a diagnosis purely based on lipoprotein electrophoresis okay so in type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia what can you expect you can expect a broad beta band that is why this condition is called as broad beta disease or familial dis beta lipoproteinemia so type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia has got three names what are the three names the first one is remnant disease to denote the fact that remnants accumulate in this condition the second fact about type 3 is they can name about type 3 is it is broad beta disease or familial dis beta lipoproteinemia okay so that's about type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia very good vignesh you're right so um to exclude other choices or to understand about other choices for completion sake yeah let's look at choice a tell me what is ldl receptor defect if there is a if there is a defect of ldl receptor what will you call it as you will call it as type 2a hyperlipoproteinemia which is otherwise called as familial hypercholesterolemia and do you find anything dermatologically in type 2a hyperlipoproteinemia that is called as tendon xanthomas whenever there is an elevation of only cholesterol what will you observe you will observe tendon xanthomas so what are tendon xanthomas these are small eruptive lesions which are present along the line of attachment of tendons for example you will find them along the knuckles or you will find them along the ankles do you see that here small eruptive lesions which are present along the line of attachment of tendons either along the knuckles or along the ankles So, if you see tendon xanthomas, then what is the clue? The clue is there is an elevation of only cholesterol, probably type two A hyperlipoproteinemia. Now, about choice B, yes, atherosclerosis and tendon xanthomas. Very good. So, type uh, choice B and choice D. Whenever there is a defect of either a POC two or lipoprotein lipase, chylomicron metabolism will get affected. i hope you remember that chylomicron metabolism is initiated by 
oppose C2 activating lipoprotein lipase. So whenever there is a defect of either oppose C2 or lipoprotein lipase, which lipoprotein will accumulate in the circulation? Chylomicron will accumulate in the circulation. So oppose C2 defect or lipoprotein lipase defect is otherwise called as familial chylomicronemia syndrome. It is otherwise called as familial chylomicronemia syndrome or type 1. And you know chylomicron carries triacylglycerol. So in this condition there is a massive elevation of TGL. I said the normal value of TGL is supposed to be less than 150 milligram per deciliter. And in a patient with familial chylomicronemia syndrome or type 1 hyperlipoproteinemia, TGL value can be as high as 1500 milligram per deciliter, massive elevation of TGL. And whenever there is a massive elevation of TGL, you will see eruptive xanthomas. So please don't get confused between tendon xanthomas and eruptive xanthomas. I showed you tendon xanthomas along the line of attachment of tendons. Whereas eruptive xanthomas are even tinier than tendon xanthomas and they are present along the extensor surfaces of limbs. Can you see that here? Yeah, can you see this? So these are small eruptive lesions which are present along the extensor surfaces of limb. So that's about eruptive xanthomas. So whenever you see eruptive xanthomas, what will you suspect? Hi PK. Whenever you see eruptive xanthomas, what will you suspect? You will suspect an elevation of TGL. So how will you be able to differentiate eruptive xanthomas from phrenoderma? How many of you know about phrenoderma? Do you know that phrenoderma is otherwise called as follicular hyperkeratosis? Yeah, phrenoderma is otherwise called as follicular hyperkeratosis. And this is caused by either vitamin A deficiency or essential fatty acid deficiency. So how will you differentiate eruptive xanthomas from phrenoderma? Yes, very good. Yes, vitamin A deficiency, excellent. Essential fatty acid deficiency, Rameshwar. It is not amino acid deficiency. So to differentiate the two conditions, you check whether there is a keratin plug in the tip. So small eruptive lesions with keratin plug in the tip is phrenoderma or follicular hyperkeratosis caused by vitamin A deficiency or essential fatty acid deficiency. Whereas if you see just small eruptive lesions, if it's a white person, Okay, in a white person, you'll also see a red halo around it. But in Indian skin, you won't be able to differentiate it. So if there is no keratin plug, then it's most probably eruptive xanthomas, which is indicative of an elevation of triglyceride. And this is present in type 1 hyperlipoproteinemia or familial chylomicronemia syndrome. No problem, Rameshwar. It's uh, just a learning process, right? So can we summarize all that I told you so far? Yeah, what is the summary? As I told you, if you see eruptive xanthoma, if you see eruptive xanthomas, then what is your diagnosis? It is elevation of TGL. When do you see an elevation of TGL? You see an elevation of TGL in type 1 or type 4 or in type 5. Whereas if you see tendon xanthomas, yeah, what is your diagnosis? It's indicative of an elevation of cholesterol. When will you see an elevation of cholesterol? It is type 2A. Okay, and I told you one pathogno no, two pathognomonic features of type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia dermatologically. What are the two findings I told you? One is xanthoma palmaris striae. Um, yeah, good evening Kartik Narayan. Xanthoma palmaris striae. Okay, the other one is palmar eruptive xanthomas. So if you see xanthoma palmaris triae or palmar eruptive xanthomas, then what is your diagnosis? Your diagnosis is type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia, which is caused by APOE defect. It is E2, E2 genotype. Is that clear? Yes, familial bisbeta lipoproteinemia. So tell me what is the right answer here? The right answer here is E2, E2 genotype. So what is that you see in the image, all of you? Try to tell me, what do we see in the image? You already know the answer. A 15-year-old boy presented to the ophthalmology department with an acute reduction in visual acuity in both the eyes. So spontaneously something has happened which has resulted in the reduction in the acuity of vision. And what is that you observe here? 
yeah what is that you observe here there is superotemporal dislocation of lens yeah superotemporal dislocation of lens then what do you think is the diagnosis it is most probably marfan syndrome thank you mohammed my reading it right yes yes what is it it is marfan syndrome so the question is all about marfan syndrome the ophthalmologist suspected a disorder and ordered for genetic testing which revealed fbn1 gene mutation so it is confirmed right fbn1 gene mutation or fibrillin gene mutation is marfan syndrome which of the following is true about the disorder and the protein involved very good oxytocin good nisha good nikshain devi excellent so what is the right answer the protein reduces tgf beta levels which is true is the question very good rameshwar ritu yeah the answer is fibrillin protein reduces tgf beta levels okay so why did i exclude all the other choices do you think it's an autosomal recessive disorder do you think it's an autosomal recessive disorder you know uh, marfan syndrome is autosomal dominant does the does the protein involved reduce the elasticity no it increases the elasticity okay and do you give alpha 2 agonists or beta blockers what is that we give yeah to avoid the progression we are not giving alpha 2 agonists i'll tell you the basics here yes so we are going to now discuss about marfan syndrome before we discuss about marfan syndrome what is your observation here the observation is a spontaneous superotemporal dislocation of the lens and the most common cause of spontaneous bilateral superotemporal dislocation of the lens will be marfan syndrome and in reverse marfan syndrome most commonly presents with spontaneous superotemporal dislocation of the lens so either case what will be a suspicion marfan syndrome and you know marfan syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition and this is caused by mutation of fbn1 gene in chromosome 15 Yeah, it's caused by mutation of FBN1 gene in chromosome 15, and this gene codes for a protein called as fibrillin. Now, what is the function? What are the functions of fibrillin protein? Fibrillin protein helps in forming microfibrils in the connective tissue. It helps in forming microfibrils in connective tissues, and these microfibrils are either associated with elastin. Sometimes they are associated with elastin. Sometimes they are not associated with elastin. what if they are associated with elastin in that case they help in improvement of elasticity of the connective tissue and this is the type yeah fibrillin along with elastin increases the elasticity of the tissue and this is the type that is present in skin this is the type that is present in lung and in blood vessels so fibrillin is associated with elastin in the case of skin lungs and blood vessels now tell me what is expected when there is fibrillin gene mutation there is reduction in the elasticity of all these tissues can you tell me what will happen when lung loses its elasticity every time you breathe in the lung expands yeah but what happens when you stop inspiring the elastic recoiling of lung will bring it back to the original position right now when there is no elasticity the lung keeps expanding it does not come back to its original shape and that is why a uh, marfan syndrome patient presents with bulle right because if it keeps expanding what will it result in it result in bulle and pneumothorax okay now without elastin what is its function without elastin it helps in improving the tensile strength of few connective tissues and that is the type which is present in joints that is the type which is present in suspensory ligaments of limb and apart from these two functions fibrillin protein also helps in reducing tgf beta why are you trying to reduce tgf beta because tgf beta causes necrosis okay now think and tell me what is expected when fibrillin gene is mutated and fibrillin protein is not produced properly as i told you connective tissues lose their elasticity then connective tissues lose their elasticity for example in lung if the elasticity is lost that causes bulle and pneumothorax then blood vessels lose their elasticity blood vessels expand so if the root of the aorta expands what will it uh, result in aortic regurgitation or mitral valve prolapse okay it causes aortic regurgitation mitral valve prolapse and i told you it reduces tgf beta now that it is mutated there is no reduction in tgf beta so there is increase in tgf beta levels that will stimulate necrosis 
and that causes cystic medial necrosis of aorta. And this cystic medial necrosis is the reason for dissection of aorta. I hope you all remember that Marfan syndrome presents with aortic dissection because of cystic medial necrosis. Reason is there is no reduction in TGF beta, there is excess TGF beta levels. Okay. And when it loses its tensile strength, very good all of you. I am happy that all of you are active in the chat box. Any synergy between elastic tissue and collagen or they function opposite way. Uh, as far as connective tissues are concerned, depending upon where they are present, they either improve elasticity or they improve the tensile strength. Okay. So collagen, we have various types of collagen. Depending upon the type of collagen that we are talking about, it either improves elasticity or it improves tensile strength. Does that answer your question, uh, Meet Patel? Yeah. So when it loses its tensile strength, what will it result in? In the joints, if there is no tensile strength, that will cause arachnodactyly. Yeah, hyperextensibility, right? Arachnodactyly, hyperextensibility. And when suspensory ligaments of limb become weak, that causes dislocation of the limbs. So which type of dislocation do you see in Marfan syndrome? It is supratemporal dislocation of lens. When do you see inframedial dislocation of lens, all of you? Please answer, inframedial dislocation of lens is seen in type 1 homocystinuria. Not only type 1, any homocystinuria, there is infronasal dislocation of lens. So, can we try to differentiate Marfan syndrome? Very good, is homocystinuria. Good, Nikhil. Very good, Anamika. Good, Sushma. Oxytocin, Pragati. Excellent. So, what did I tell you? I am going to now help you differentiate Marfan syndrome. Suppose you see a child presenting with dislocation of lens. Of course, you see where it is dislocated. You will be able to differentiate it then by doing genetic testing. But clinically, based on few facts, you will be able to differentiate Marfan syndrome and homocystinuria. I am going to fill up this tabular column with your help. Will you all help me? So, tell me about inheritance. Marfan syndrome is caused by... Uh, what kind of inheritance do you observe in Marfan syndrome? It is autosomal dominant. Right. It is autosomal dominant. Whereas homocystinuria is autosomal recessive. Which gene mutation causes Marfan syndrome? Just now I told you fibrillin 1 gene mutation in chromosome 15. Whereas homocystinuria, there are many types of homocystinuria. And type 1 homocystinuria is caused by the defect of Cystathionin beta synthase. It is caused by the defect of cystathionin beta synthase gene in chromosome 21. Okay, whereas type 2 homocystinuria is caused by the defect of methionine synthase. So, whenever I tell you a fact, my humble request to you all is please memorize it. My second request is please don't waste your time writing down every fact. Okay, because I feel whenever you start writing, you get distracted. Right? That happens, right? So, please don't waste time writing down everything because the PDF will be shared in the Telegram channel of Tetlada. Okay? So, uh, just watch the session. Try to understand all concepts and memorize all facts real time. Don't think I'll go back and revise and re uh, remember later. That never happens. Okay? So, type 1 homocystinuria is caused by the defect of cystathionin beta synthase and type 2 homocystinuria is caused by the defect of methionine synthase. Okay, so this is the second difference, gene mutation. Lens dislocation, tell me, Marfan syndrome is superotemporal dislocation of the lens, whereas homocystinuria is infronasal dislocation of the lens. And how do joints behave in the case of Marfan syndrome? Just now I told you, hyperextensibility. Yeah, it is hyperextensibility in Marfan syndrome, whereas in homocystinuria, it is restricted joints. Joint movements are highly restricted in homocystinuria. And blood vessel wise, Marfan syndrome, I said, presents with uh, dilatation, right? Aortic dilatation, that is why aortic regurgitation. So here you see dilatation of blood vessels because of loss of elasticity, whereas in homocystinuria, it presents as a vaso-occlusive disorder. Do you understand this? It presents as a vaso-occlusive disorder. And if you ask me about the treatment, 
Yeah, in the case of Marfan syndrome, I won't call it as a treatment, but if you want to avoid complications, if you want to avoid complications like aortic dissection, then what we prescribe is beta blockers because beta blockers reduce TGF beta levels, okay, or losartan. So all these can be prescribed to avoid complications, whereas in the case of homocystinuria, for type 1 homocystinuria, because cystathione and beta synthase is dependent on B6, you can treat it with B6 supplementation. If it's type 2 homocystinuria, you will have to supplement B12 and folate. You will have to supplement B12 and folate. Is that clear? Yes, stroke-like presentation is what I call as vaso-occlusive disorder. Okay, so can we quickly discuss the differences between Marfan syndrome and the homocystinuria? Marfan syndrome is autosomal dominant. Homocystinuria are all autosomal recessive. Marfan syndrome is caused by the mutation of FBN1 gene in chromosome 15. Type 1 homocystinuria is caused by the defect of cystathione and beta synthase in chromosome 21. And then uh, dislocation of lens, superotemporal dislocation in the case of Marfan's, infronasal in the case of homocystinuria. Blood vessels are dilated in uh, Marfan's, it is uh, vaso-occlusive disorder in homocystinuria. Joints, hyperextensible joints in uh, Marfan syndrome, that is uh, restricted joint movement in type 1 or any homocystinuria. And treatment wise, what did I tell you is the difference? In the case of Marfan syndrome, we provide, we, we prescribe beta blockers and losartan. Whereas in the case of homocystinuria, depending upon the type, you can go for B6, B12 or folate administration. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Manish. Yeah. So what is the right answer, all of you? The protein reduces TGF beta levels. Is that true or false? Yes. It reduces TGF beta levels. Alpha 2 agonists delay the progression? No. Beta blockers will delay the progression. Is it an autosomal recessive disorder? No, it is autosomal dominant. The protein involved reduces the elasticity of tissues normally. It improves elasticity. That is why when there is a mutation, Elasticity is suppressed, that is why you see bullet, pneumothorax and then um, blood vessels are dilated, okay. So, I will give you 30 seconds time. Tell me the right answer for this question. 8 month old infant presents with hypoglycemia on examination hepatomegaly was observed. Blood investigation revealed lactic acidosis, ketosis, xanthomas. Have you all answered? What is the most probable enzyme deficiency? Nikhil has answered it as glucose 6-phosphatase. All of you say it's glucose 6-phosphatase defect. Dr. Reformer thinks it's choice C. Very good. Dr. Sarika says it's von Gierke's disease. Minu, Neepiji, 2023, they all think it's choice C. Okay. So let's start excluding choices. Okay. Before we start excluding choices, can you summarize the history? So... Uh, as I have already told you, whenever there is a case-based MCQ, do not jump to an answer immediately. Try to summarize the finding first, okay? Because if you follow a systematic way of approaching a case-based MCQ, many a times you will get the answer right, okay? So just summarize the history. If you summarize, what is the principal presenting feature here? The principal presenting feature here is hypoglycemia. That is what is mentioned first, right? There is a neonate or there is an 8 month old infant presenting with hypoglycemia. If it is hypoglycemia, I would not choose choice C. What is choice C? Acid maltase defect. Acid maltase is otherwise called as alpha glucosidase. What is acid maltase? It is otherwise called as alpha glucosidase. When this enzyme is defective, you call it as Pompe's disease. And this Pompe's disease is one glycogen storage disorder, which is also a lysosomal storage disorder. This was asked once. So all of you tell me if you ask which is the one glycogen storage disorder, which is also a lysosomal storage disorder, what will be your answer? Your answer should be Pompe's disease or type 2 glycogen storage disorder. Because acid maltase or alpha glucosidase is a lysosomal enzyme. And this enzyme is related to metabolizing glycogen. It is related to metabolizing just 2 percentage of glycogen in muscle. Okay, not in liver, only in muscle. 
So when muscle glycogen metabolism gets affected, what do you expect? When cardiac muscle glycogen metabolism gets affected, that will present as cardiomegaly. 2% of glycogen cardiac muscle is not getting metabolized. So that will cause cardiomegaly and cardiomyopathy. So if they ask you which glycogen storage disorder will present with cardiomegaly or cardiomyopathy, what will be your answer? Cardiomegaly or cardiomyopathy, it is type 2 glycogen storage disorder. Okay. And uh, skeletal muscle, when skeletal muscle glycogen metabolism gets affected, that will cause hypotonia. Yeah, when I say hypotonia, the child will present as a floppy baby. I saw one answer is very good, Neelam Bhatia. Yes, it will present as a floppy baby. So how will you diagnose a floppy baby? Checking few reflexes. Suppose you're holding the baby by the tummy. Yeah, you're holding the baby by the tummy. What do you expect? You expect all four limbs to go up like a parachute. In a floppy baby, what will you see? All four limbs will be hanging down. Yeah, that is a floppy baby syndrome. Okay, so one of the causes of floppy baby syndrome is type 2 glycogen storage disorder or Pompe's disease, which is caused by the defect of acid maltase or alpha glucosidase. It has got nothing to do with hypoglycemia. Does that clarify all your doubts? Yeah, does that clarify all your doubts? So this is not acid maltase defect. Now, when will you see hypoglycemia? You are going to see hypoglycemia as a presenting feature only when there is a defect of glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis. Yeah, only when there is a defect of glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis, you will find hypoglycemia. Can you get this registered in your memory? All of you? Yes or no? Yeah, only when there is a defect of these two pathways. Because what are the two pathways that we have for maintaining plasma glucose? Just these two pathways, okay? Now, having that in your mind, look at choice A. Branching enzyme is an enzyme of which pathway, all of you? Branching enzyme is an enzyme of glycogen synthesis. It's an enzyme of glycogen synthesis. Similarly, glycogen synthase is also an enzyme of glycogen synthesis. So if glycogen synthesis is affected, will it present as hypoglycemia? No. Okay. So in the case of branching enzyme defect or glycogen synthase defect, it is not going to present as hypoglycemia. So what are you left with? You are left with only one choice, which is choice D. Yeah. What is it? That is glucose 6-phosphatase defect. So what is my suggestion to you all? Whenever you see a case-based MCQ, step number one is to summarize. Step number two is to exclude choices. Yeah, do not jump to an answer. Please exclude choices using all the logical reasoning abilities that you have. Yeah, that is why you are supposed to be mindful when you write your exams. Is that clear? So it's not about how much you prepare. It is about how you approach the exam. Right. So that is why writing a grant test is important. Okay, so whenever you write a grant test, give a grant test as if that is going to be a final exam. Okay, give it all. Every MCQ should be treated as a life to you. Yeah, every MCQ should be approached multidimensionally. You should use all the facts, all the concepts that you have learned so far related to that topic. You should be optimistic about the fact that yes, I will be able to answer that MCQ. Okay, so with that approach, if you handle, if you um, approach every MCQ, you will be able to answer it. Is that clear? So how many of you are writing grant test? I will tell you. I will tell you about why xanthomas and buttex now. I will tell you about every fact that is provided here. Okay. Because uh, I feel only when you reason out manifestations of any disorder, you will be able to interpret it when you see it clinically. Okay. Many a times when you read it from the textbook, yeah, if you use mnemonics, if you just try to blindly memorize it, when you see it in the real life, you won't be able to interpret it. But if you uh, understand it. If you reason it out and learn, when you see it in real life, you'll be able to quickly pick up the diagnosis. Only then you'll be a good clinician. So my suggestion to you all is, please learn every subject conceptually. So coming back to the question which I asked you, half, half of questions getting wrong. Please don't worry about it. The reason behind why I'm asking you to write the grant test is not to see your marks. Yeah, that is not to check your performance. That is to improve your performance. Do you understand this? Writing a grant test is not to check your performance. It is to improve your performance. 
So every time you write a grand test, you are going to uh, treat it as if it's your final exam. All 200 MCQ should be treated as one like every MCQ. Okay, so approach it that way and after the grand test, please solve the grand test paper. That is more important. Okay, so I'll tell you about grand test in some other session. But uh, uh, confused between two options, that happens to everybody, Anamika. All that you need is the confidence. Yeah, uh, why do you think we are given a multiple choice question based exam? Uh, I mean, why do you think NEET PG always has an MCQ based exam? Need PG or next, why do you think we are given an MCQ based exam? Yeah, it is because you should have that intuitive ability to choose among choices. Do you understand that? You should develop that intuitive ability to choose among choices because when you start uh, practicing, when you become a clinician, do you think every patient will come with a black and white diagnosis? Are you going to meet every patient with a black and white diagnosis? No, there will be lots of gray areas. Okay, So you should develop that ability to delineate the gray color into either black or white. Okay, And that comes purely by practice. That is why working out MCQ is essential. Okay? So on the day of exam or only during grand test, if you are going to approach MCQs, you won't be able to do it. So MCQ, answering an MCQ should be there in your blood. So that much practice is necessary. Got it? Yeah, thank you all of you. Class is one hour. Uh, I will continue for like one hour and 15 minutes or one hour or 30 minutes. Thanks, MS. I'm happy that you're liking my way of teaching. Yes, how to maintain study time on during um, internship. Okay, we will discuss about all that in a separate session. Um, uh, so we probably will have a non-academic session just to... Uh, just for you to understand uh, what to do and what not to do, okay? So because I have few MCQs to discuss, nowadays in all platforms, GT in all platforms are just overburdened with unnecessary long questions to make it clinical, just to impress students, exams, questions look pretty good and easy than that of uh, GT, yeah. So when you practice, um, you should, when you practice, if you're approaching, if you're going to see such uh, complex MCQs, when you see your exam, when you see your exam paper, it's going to feel easier, right? The reverse is going to be difficult. Yeah, if you're tuned to answering uh, such complex MCQs, when you see a simple MCQ, you'll be able to get it right, okay? So it's always better to practice with tough MCQs rather than seeing a tough MCQ in your exam, okay? So don't worry about the quality of the grant test that you're doing. Uh, you will be able to get my complete biochemistry videos on Prep Ladder app. You are tired from morning already. Okay. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so that is what I was telling you. So let's try to understand about one gear keys. Yes, let's try to understand about one gear keys disease. What is one gear keys disease? It is type 1 glycogen storage disorder, wherein the enzyme which is defective is glucose 6 phosphatase. So tell me what is the enzyme that is defective in one gear keys disease? It is glucose 6 phosphatase. And what is that you know about glucose 6-phosphatase? It's an enzyme of not only glycogenolysis but also of gluconeogenesis. Do you all know that? Because whenever you learn biochemistry, if you are using a, a notes kind of a book, then you would have learned that glucose 6-phosphatase is an enzyme of gluconeogenesis. But I want you to know that glucose 6-phosphatase is an enzyme which is common to both glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So when that common point is defective, both the pathways cannot maintain plasma glucose. So the principal presenting feature of von Gierke's or type 1 glycogen storage disorder is going to be hypoglycemia. And classically, this hypoglycemia does not respond to counter-regulatory hormone administration. So what do you mean by counter-regulatory hormone administration? What are the counter-regulatory hormones of insulin? A hormone which acts against insulin is glucagon, right? So glucagon is a counter-regulatory hormone, growth hormone, nor epinephrine, cortisol. So what are the counter-regulatory hormones of insulin? Glucagon, growth hormone, nor epinephrine, cortisol. Usually when a child or a neonate presents with hypoglycemia, to find out the cause and to treat hypoglycemia, we try to check what is the response to counter-regulatory hormone administration. 
when all the other causes of hypoglycemia will respond to counter regulatory hormone administration the one inborn error of metabolism which does not respond to counter regulatory hormone administration is von Gierke's disease because in von Gierke's disease both glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis cannot maintain plasma glucose and all these counter regulatory hormones do not have any magic to increase plasma glucose the only way by which they increase plasma glucose is by stimulating glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So which condition does not respond to counter regulatory hormone administration? It is von Gierke's disease. Okay. And when glucose 6-phosphatase is defective, the glucose 6-phosphate that accumulates will get into glycolysis. Yes or no? Glucose 6-phosphate will get into glycolysis. And what will you get as a product of glycolysis? You will get 2-pyruvate. Now both these pyruvate will be acted upon by pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and it forms acetyl-CoA. And what will this acetyl-CoA be used for? Acetyl-CoA is a building block for fatty acid and cholesterol. Do you all know that? Acetyl-CoA is a building block of both fatty acid and cholesterol. So in von Gierke's disease, when glucose 6-phosphatase is defective, glucose 6-phosphate gets into glycolysis. It forms pyruvate. Pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA will be used for fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. And excess fatty acid will be stored as triacylglycerol. And excess cholesterol will be stored as cholesterol ester. So a child of von Gierke's disease does not only present with hypoglycemia. Additionally, they also present with hypertriglyceridemia and hypercholesterolemia. Okay, so can you tell me what is expected when there is uh, hypertriglyceridemia and hypercholesterolemia? That will cause xanthomas. Do you all understand this? That will cause xanthomas. And the excess triglyceride will accumulate in organs. And that causes organomegaly. So what will you see? Von Gierke's children present with hepatosplenomegaly and renomegaly because of accumulation of triglyceride. And they present with xanthomas in multiple regions. Okay, and because triglyceride accumulates in cheeks, we call it as a doll-like faces. Have you seen this phrase anywhere? All of you, have you heard of this phrase? Doll-like faces. So what is the reason for doll-like faces that is seen in von Gierke's disease? Triglyceride accumulates in the adipose tissue that is present in cheek that will make the child's face look like a doll's face. So doll-like faces, okay. So have you understood all this? So what did I tell you? Von Gierke's disease is glucose 6-phosphatase defect. That causes hypoglycemia. And this hypoglycemia does not respond to counter-regulatory hormone administration. Additionally, glucose 6-phosphate gets into glycolysis. It forms pyruvate. Pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is used for fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. Excess fatty acid will be stored as triacylglycerol, cholesterol will be stored as cholesterol ester. And this hypertriglyceridemia and hypercholesterolemia will be the reason for xanthomas. And hypertriglyceridemia is the reason for hepatosplenomegaly, renomegaly and doll-like faces. Okay. And additionally, as some of you had answered it, yes, Sushant, yes. So acetyl CoA has got multiple fates. The major fate of acetyl-CoA is that it gets into citric acid cycle and it comes out as carbon dioxide. Yes or no? What is the major fate of acetyl-CoA? It gets into citric acid cycle, comes out as carbon dioxide. If acetyl-CoA is not able to get into citric acid cycle, acetyl-CoA will condense to form ketone bodies. Acetoacetate, beta-hydroxybutrate, all these are formed from acetyl-CoA when acetyl-CoA is not able to get into citric acid cycle. So, formation of carbon dioxide and formation of ketone bodies will happen when the energy status of the cell is low. If the energy status of the cell is high and if there is acetyl-CoA formation, will you want to waste the acetyl-CoA by pushing it into citric acid cycle? You won't do that. So when the energy status of the cell is high, that is when acetyl-CoA is used for fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. So now do you understand the various states of acetyl-CoA? Yes or no? Yes, Rotheras test will be positive. Yes. 
Okay. So when astai koye uh, accumulates, not always astai koye will be able to enter into fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. So when excess astai koye accumulates, that will become ketone bodies. And that is why Von Hierke's children present with ketosis. They also present with lactic acidosis. Why do you find lactic acidosis in Von Hierke's disease? Because there is excess entry of glucose into glycolysis. And through glycolysis, it forms pyruvate. Some pyruvate will become acetylcholine. Some pyruvate will become lactate. That is why you see lactic acidosis. So, have you understood all about acetylcholine never turn to glucose? Yes, Kushbu. Acetylcholine can never become glucose. Acetylcholine can never get into gluconeogenesis. Okay. So, uh, can you summarize and tell me the features of von Hierke's disease? I want the light chat to be active, please. What are the features of von Hierke's disease or type 1 glycogen storage disorder? Because it's being frequently asked. So, the first and prominent feature would be hypoglycemia, which does not respond to counter-regulatory hormone administration. Additionally, you see hypertriglyceridemia, hypercholesterolemia. So, you see xanthomas, doll-like faces, hepatosthenomegaly, renomegaly. And then astaicoe condenses to form ketone body. So, you see ketosis and lactic acidosis. Got it? Good. Uh, can you please explain fates of astaicoe again? Yeah, I will tell you. Fates of astaicoe, right? Okay. Uh, one second. Let me add a page here. So, what are the fates of acetyl-CoA? Hyperuricemia is. Yes. So, what are the fates of acetyl-CoA? The first fate of acetyl-CoA is. So, the major fate of acetyl-CoA is that it gets into citric acid cycling. If it gets into citric acid cycling, every acetyl-CoA will come out as carbon dioxide which you can exhale out. Got it? Because what is the first step of citric acid cycling? Acetyl-CoA combines with oxaloacetate to form citrate. That is one fate. But if there is no oxaloacetate, acetyl-CoA will not be able to get into citric acid cycle. If it cannot get into citric acid cycle, then acetyl-CoA condenses to form ketone bodies. So these two fates will happen when there is low energy. Do you understand this? These two fates happen when there is low energy. On the other hand, when there is high energy, high energy status will inhibit every enzyme of citric acid cycle. Do you understand this? Whenever there is high energy, high energy status will inhibit every enzyme of citric acid cycle. So, acetyl-CoA condenses, acetyl-CoA accumulates. Now, when acetyl-CoA accumulates and when there is high energy, acetyl-CoA will be used for fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. So, fates of acetyl-CoA can be classified as what happens when there is low energy, what happens when there is high energy. Low energy, acetyl-CoA enters into citric acid cycle, comes out as carbon dioxide or it becomes ketone bodies. High energy, acetyl-CoA will be used for fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. Does that answer all your questions? Good. One second. Because I tried adding a page, it is stuck now. So, we were in an image-based MCQ. Yes, acetyl-CoA allosterically activates pyruvate carboxylase is right, dark night. That is why acetyl-CoA cannot form glucose, but acetyl-CoA can stimulate gluconeogenesis. Okay, so this is the next MCQ. It's an image-based MCQ. This was asked recently, right? So, what is this diagnosis? Rapid revision of biochem today. Okay. Yes. So, what is that? Yes. Uh, I already showed you the answer. All of you are right. What is it? It is Tangier's disease. So, what is that you see here? You see grayish orange tonsils. Don't you see that? 
yeah it is grayish orange tonsils and that is tangious disease and how to remember the tangious disease presents with grayish orange tonsils have you all had tang juice yeah tang juice yeah tang juice which is what color orange color so whenever you see orange color tonsil what will you relate it to tang tangious disease okay and what is tangious disease due to yes tangious disease is caused by the defect of a b c a1 it is caused by the defect of a b c a1 what is a b c a1 it is atp binding cassette transporter 1 and this is an enzyme that is related to hdl metabolism so whenever there is a b c a1 mutation that causes tangious disease which is characterized by grayish orange tonsils hepatosplenomegaly mononeuritis multiplex it is not only characterized by grayish orange tonsils it is also characterized by hepatosplenomegaly and mononeuritis multiplex okay and in this condition when a b c a1 is mutated hdl level will be very low so these are the facts that you should remember about thank you dr time i'm happy that you're enjoying it yes it's a hypo alpha lipoproteinemia so that's about tangious disease. Now let's exclude or now let's try to understand about other choices. So what is old man's disease? Old man's disease is caused by acid lipase defect. Yes or no? Old man's disease is caused by acid lipase defect. And this acid lipase, I think I discussed about this in the last session. Uh, acid lipase is related to metabolizing lipids. Okay. So this defect will affect only those tissues wherein lipid turnover is faster. So what are the tissues wherein lipid turnover is faster? First is enterocytes, right? Yes, adrenal calcification. Yes, you're all right. So one is enterocyte wherein the lipid turnover is higher. Not only enterocyte, even adrenal cortex. Yeah, even adrenal cortex, the lipid turnover is higher. Liver, the lipid turnover is higher. So whenever there is old man's disease, which is caused by the defect of acid lipase, what are the tissues which get affected? Starting from enterocytes, number two, adrenal cortex, number three is liver. Okay, so when enterocytes get affected, here enterocytes are not able to absorb the lipid properly. So that will cause greeny diarrhea. So what is one feature of old man's disease? There is greeny diarrhea. When adrenal cortex acid lipase is defective, in adrenal cortex all lipids accumulate, triacylglycerol accumulate in the adrenal cortex. On accumulation of triacylglycerol, sodium hydroxide, an alkali like sodium hydroxide will try to cleave this triacylglycerol, will take out the fatty acid and it forms soap. Okay, So sodium salts of fatty acid will be called as soap and this soap will facilitate calcification. And that is why what do you observe? Adrenal calcification. When in liver the turnover gets affected, that causes hepatomegaly. So can you tell me what are the three features of old man's disease or acid lipase defect? It presents with greeny diarrhea number one because enterocyte gets affected. Adrenal cortex gets affected. So triglyceride accumulates that causes soap formation that facilitates calcification of adrenal cortex. And then when liver gets affected, it presents with hepatomegaly. And if at all an image-based question is asked on old man's disease, the image is going to be adrenal calcification. Yes or no? That is going to be, uh, can you see that here? Adrenal calcification. So if adrenal cortex is calcified, what should you think of old man's disease? Okay. Now about Gaucher's disease. The second condition is choice B is Gaucher's disease which is caused by the defect of beta-glucosidase. Then beta-glucosidase is defective, glucosyl ceramide accumulates. And glucosyl ceramide is a part of membranes of RBCs and platelets. So RBC membrane and platelet membrane accumulate abnormal glucosyl ceramide. Now macrophages sense that there is something abnormal, abnormal about RBCs and platelets. So macrophages will cause lysis of these cells. And that is why what do you observe? You observe anemia and thrombocytopenia. And after macrophages engulf these RBC membrane and platelet membrane, within macrophages, these membranes accumulate like fibrils. Yeah, membranes accumulate like fibrils. And that is the reason for tissue paper cells, crumpled tissue paper appearance. Is pathognomonic of what? 
yes glucosal cerebroside both are same both are same so what is the function of beta glucosidase beta glucosidase acts on glucosal ceramide what is the other name for glucosal ceramide glucosal ceramide is a cerebroside so you call it as glucosal cerebroside so the other name for beta glucosidase is glucosal cerebroside yeah glucosal cerebroside both names are the same so gotcher's disease is caused by the defect of beta glucosidase or glucosal cerebroside okay and what are the manifestations i told you rbc's and platelets undergo lysis so you see anemia thrombocytopenia membranes get engulfed by macrophages when these membranes accumulate like fibrils that is the reason for crumpled tissue paper appearance and there is another image based question that can be asked as far as gotcher's disease is concerned it is ellen mayer flask deformity don't you all know that yeah yeah this is a defect of diametaphysis of femur okay diametaphysis of femur defect cause makes the femur look like an ellen mayer flask so this is an image based question that is possible for gotcher's disease okay so how many of you want to know about this mcq to find out what type of inhibition is it identify the type of inhibition difference between hb a1c and fructosamin so what is hb a1c hb a1c is glycated hemoglobin it is nothing but the proportion of the hemoglobin which has got non enzymatically added to carbohydrate residues do you all understand this what is glycated hemoglobin it is a proportion of the total hemoglobin that has got attached to a glucose or a carbohydrate residue by non enzymatic mechanism so how will this happen when will this happen as the blood glucose concentration increases the probability that these carbohydrate residues go and get attached to hemoglobin is higher so hb a1c concentration will increase as the blood glucose concentration increases but why are you estimating this because once it is non enzymatically glycated this hemoglobin which is glycated will stay in the circulation as long as the rbc's are alive yes so it is not a reversible process once it is glycated it's going to be there for the lifetime of rbc's okay so lifetime of rbc's is 120 days so for the last 6 to 8 weeks about the control about the glycemic control of an individual if you want to assess what should you estimate you should estimate hb a1c because it's an irreversible glycation got it are you all clear about it instead if you are going to just estimate fasting plasma glucose and postprandial plasma glucose like what we have been doing for a very long time this is going to be subjected to recent variations in glycemic control suppose there is a diabetic individual who knows that okay in the next week i'm i will have to give my blood for testing and i'll have to meet my diabetologist so let me be good for this one week the person takes the person pops tablets the person works out reduces the blood glucose so that's going to give a false promise yeah that's going to give a false promise to the diabetologist and to the patient so you want to know about long term glycemic control that is why we estimate hb a1c but what will happen when you estimate hb a1c in an individual with iron deficiency anemia can you all answer method of estimation is cation exchange chromatography i am very sure the question was the most widely used method for hb a1c estimation am i right the most widely used method for hb a1c estimation that is cation exchange chromatography but take it from me hb a1c can be estimated by cation exchange chromatography can be estimated by affinity chromatography can be estimated by electrophoresis by immuno immuno assay so there are many methods for hb a1c estimation but which is the most widely used technology it is cation exchange chromatography got it yes so i was asking you about something right can you all answer that what did i ask you i asked you what will happen when you estimate hb a1c levels in a person with iron deficiency anemia in iron deficiency anemia tell me what will happen to rbc turnover your body knows that the body does not have adequate iron so the body will try to preserve rbcs if it preserves rbcs life span of rbcs will be longer 
and if the lifespan of rbc is longer the probability that these rbcs get exposed to glucose is higher so there will be false elevation of hba1c values do you all understand this? there will be a false elevation of hba1c values in a patient with iron deficiency anemia because the turnover of rbcs is reduced in contrast what will happen to hba1c values in a person with hemolytic anemia answer this please hemolytic anemia in hemolysis the lifespan of rbc is reduced so the probability that these rbcs are exposed to glucose is low so that is going to give a false low value of hba1c so the question was yeah the recent i think it was a neat pg question the question was in a person with hemolytic anemia or in a person with anemia what will you estimate to understand long term glycemic control in that case we should not estimate h you should not estimate hba1c you will have to estimate fructosamin okay what is fructosamin it is glycated albumin it is not glycated hemoglobin it is glycated albumin so it remains glycated for the life span of albumin okay but albumin's life span is not 120 days so you will not be able to assess 6 to 8 weeks of glycemic control it gets reduced okay that is the difference between hba1c and fructosamin so generally what is preferred hba1c is preferred but in a person with anemia or hemolytic anemia iron deficiency or hemolytic anemia it is better to estimate fructosamin which is glycated albumin got it yes it's just two weeks glycemic control launch new thing i'm happy that you uh, you are learning new things nikhil so i was asking how many of you want to know about it yeah i know most of you know or have a clue in your mind to make a diagnosis of the type of inhibition using line weaver burk plot like v shaped curve parallel lines yeah so um but i want all the students here to understand it conceptually yeah so that any variation that is asked yeah any variation that is asked you will be able to answer it okay so i'm going to help you understand this conceptually please explain preferred fuel for different tissues in different situations i will do it in the next session uh, meet patel or towards the end of the session i'll help you understand it let's finish this mcq and then i'll tell you okay yeah so identify the type of inhibition so what is the right answer here what you see here is both the curves so one curve so one is without an inhibitor the other one is with the inhibitor the image gives has given you the answer what is the right answer the right answer is non competitive inhibition okay it is non competitive inhibition but i'm going to help you understand it okay so the first fact is i want you to know about enzyme kinetics yes all of you are right choice d okay so i'm going to start from the very basic fact and i'm going to build on it so that you never get confused about such mcqs okay so listen to this enzyme kinetics so uh, what do you mean by enzyme kinetics your enzymes most of your enzymes follow saturation kinetics what do you mean by saturation kinetics if you draw a graph okay if you draw a graph with substrate concentration along x axis and velocity of the enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction along y axis what do you think will happen as you increase the substrate concentration you know that the velocity of the enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction also increases linearly yes or no thanks vignesh vishwanathan so listen to this what did i tell you as you increase the substrate concentration the rate of the enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction will also increase linearly but do you think it will increase linearly linearly forever no at one point what happens is even if you increase the substrate concentration the velocity will not be able to increase any further and it reaches a plateau right it reaches a plateau so why do you think it reaches a plateau because at this point all the available enzyme substrate binding sites have been saturated with the substrate once you have saturated all the enzyme Uh, if you increase the substrate concentration will there be an increase in the rate of the uh, enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction no so it reaches a plateau at that point the maximum velocity that is achieved is called as v max do you all understand this at that point the maximum velocity that is achieved is called as v max 
So can you tell me what is B max? B max is the maximum velocity that is achieved by an enzyme when all the available enzyme substrate binding sites have been saturated. Okay, but be it in vitro or in vivo experiments, we have never been able to increase the substrate concentration to saturate all the available enzymes. And that is why I have never allowed, I have not allowed the curve to touch the point. So this was not a mistake. Yeah, this was intentionally done to tell you that Vmax is never measurable. Why do you think Vmax is never measurable? We have never been able to saturate all the available enzyme substrate binding sites. Reason is enzymes are biocatalysts, they are required one in minute quantities. Every time the reaction gets over, the enzyme gets regenerated back. Yeah, because it keeps getting regenerated, you will never be able to saturate all the available enzyme substrate binding sites. So Vmax is never measurable. That is why we have a term called as half Vmax. Do you all understand this? Because Vmax is not measurable, halfway through what is it that is called as? Not because of the rapidness of enzyme, that is because enzymes get recycled back and forth. Yeah, they get regenerated every time. Okay, that is why you're not, you'll not be able to saturate it. Because Vmax is not measurable, we have something called as half Vmax. From half Vmax, you draw a horizontal line. From here, you draw a vertical line. The point at which it cuts the x-axis is called as Km. The point at which it cuts the x-axis is called as Km. So can you all define Km? All of you, what is Km? Km is the substrate concentration at half maximum velocity. Yes or no, what is Km? Km is the substrate concentration half maximum velocity. Suppose I say Km of an enzyme is 100 micromoles. Yeah, suppose I say Km of an enzyme is 100 micromoles. What does it mean? When the substrate concentration is 100 micromoles, this enzyme will be able to achieve half maximum velocity. Do you understand this? What does it mean when I say Km of another enzyme is 1000 micromoles? Yeah, if I say Km of another enzyme is 1000 micromoles, what does it mean? It means only when the substrate concentration is as high as 1000 micromoles, this enzyme will be able to achieve the same half maximum velocity. So if I say Km of an enzyme is high, I mean to say I have to provide more substrate. Why do I have to provide more substrate? It is because affinity of the enzyme for the substrate is low. Do you all understand this? It's because affinity of the enzyme for the substrate is low. So Km and affinity, how are they related? Km and affinity are inversely related. Higher Km means lower affinity. So have you understood it so far? It's specific to enzyme, lower the Km, higher the affinity. Yes, you're all right. Okay, so that's about Km and Vmax. Now, what is michaelis menten equation? Because I'm seeing off late so many questions on enzyme and enzyme innovation and enzyme kinetics. Okay, so please memorize michaelis menten equation. You cannot evade it. Okay, so what is michaelis menten equation? michaelis menten equation is V is equal to B max into S by Km plus S. So what is michaelis menten equation? B is equal to V max into S by Km plus S. Where what is V? V is the velocity of an enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction for a given substrate concentration. What is V max? V max is the maximum velocity that is achieved by an enzyme when all the available enzyme substrate binding sites are saturated. What is Km? Km is Michaelis constant. And what is the purpose of using this Michaelis menten equation? To find out what will be the velocity of an enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction for a given substrate concentration. Are you all with me? Yeah, if you are with me, can I see a thumbs up? What is this Michaelis menten equation used for? It is to find out what will be the velocity of an enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction for a given substrate concentration. But do you think you will be able to use this equation straight away? Can you use this equation straight away? No. Why can't you? Because one of the terms Vmax is not measurable. If you cannot measure Vmax, it means this equation cannot be used straight away. Right? That is why we use double reciprocal plot. Yeah, that is why we use double reciprocal plot. 
wherein I am going to take this michaelis lenten equation. I am going to take reciprocal of both the sides. Can you take reciprocal of both the sides? Simple maths. If I take reciprocal of this side, it is 1 by B. If I take reciprocal of the other side, it is Km plus S by B max into S. So, I have taken reciprocal of both the sides. So, what I have now is 1 by B is equal to Km plus S by B max into S. And here I see a common denominator for two terms. I don't want a common denominator. So, I am going to split it. When I split it, what will I get? 1 by B is equal to Km by B max into 1 by substrate concentration plus 1 by B max. Do you all understand this? Simple maths, right? I don't want a common denominator. Denominators, I am splitting it. So, what will I have? 1 by B is equal to Km by B max into 1 by S plus 1 by B max. This is what I have. And don't you think this is in the form of Y is equal to AX plus B? Yeah, this is in the form of y is equal to ax plus b which is the equation of a straight line. So, this tells me whenever I draw a graph with 1 by b along y axis and 1 by s along x axis, I will get a straight line. So, what does this tell me? This tells me that if I draw a graph with what along y axis? With 1 by b along y axis and 1 by s along x axis, I am going to get a straight line. So, that is what I have drawn here. I am drawing a graph with what along y axis? 1 by b. How to remember it? y and b look similar. Yes or no? y and b look similar. So, along y axis it is 1 by b. Along x axis it is 1 by s. How to remember it? x and s sound similar. Right? x and s sound similar. If I draw a graph, what will I get? I will get a straight line. Yes. Okay? So, what am I going to do with this? Uh, if I have a new enzyme, yeah, suppose I have extracted a new enzyme. I want to know what is the Bmax of this enzyme. I want to know what is the Km of the enzyme. For which, for various substrate concentrations, I will see what is the velocity of the product formation. For example, I will start with 0 0.05 micromoles. I will increase it to 0.1. I will increase it to 0.5. And then 1, 2. 3. So, for various substrate concentrations, I will see what is the velocity of the product formation. So, can I take reciprocals of this? So, for various 1 by S, I have various 1 by V. So, I have few data points. Can I plot these data points on a graph? Yeah, on a graph, if I plot these data points and if I connect, I will get a straight line. That is what it means. Okay. And if I extrapolate the straight line, I know that the straight line will cut the y-axis at one point and it will cut the x-axis at one point. Yes or no? Yeah, if I extrapolate this line, this line will cut the y-axis at one point, will cut the x-axis x -axis at one point. To find out at what point it cuts the y-axis, I am going to put x is equal to 0. You must have learned this in your school, right? To find out where a point, where a line cuts the y-axis, what should you do? You should put x is equal to 0. If I put x is equal to 0, this whole thing becomes 0. Right? So, 1 by b is equal to 1 by b mass. This means it cuts the y-axis at what point? It cuts the y-axis at 1 by b mass. Okay? To find out at what point it cuts the x-axis, I am going to put y is equal to 0. So, if I put y is equal to 0, this becomes 0. So, 0 is equal to Km by B max into S plus 1 by B max. Can you bring this 1 by B max to the other side? If you bring 1 by B max to the other side, I will get it as minus 1 by B max is equal to Km by B max into 1 by S. B max and B max will get cancelled. So, 1 by S is equal to minus 1 by Km. Right, 1 by S is equal to minus 1 by Km. So, it cuts the x-axis at what point? Minus 1 by Km. Do you all see that? It cuts the y-axis at 1 by B max. It cuts the x-axis at minus 1 by Km. Okay. So, now do you understand the purpose of using a double reciprocal plot? All of you tell me, 
what is the purpose of using a double reciprocal plot by draw by drawing a double reciprocal plot i will know what is the v max of my enzyme i will know what is the km of my enzyme so if you have a new enzyme and if you want to know what is its v max and what is its km step number 1 is you subject that enzyme to activity at various substrate concentrations you see the velocity of product formation for s you have v values so if you take reciprocal for various 1 by s i have various 1 by v and if i draw a graph with what along y axis all of you please tell me what along y axis along y axis it is 1 by v along x axis it is 1 by s i will get a straight line i will extrapolate the straight line and see at what point it cuts the y axis at what point it cuts the x axis i know the point at which it cuts the y axis is the 1 by v max of the enzyme so if i take reciprocal of it i will know what is the v max of my enzyme and i see at what point it cuts the x axis that is minus 1 by km of my enzyme if i take a reciprocal of it that will be the km of my enzyme got it all of you yeah so this is the application of double reciprocal plot or line weaver berg plot both are same do you know that this is line weaver berg plot or double reciprocal plot now another application of knowing about double reciprocal plot or line weaver berg plot is it will help you in finding out the type of inhibition it also helps you in finding out the type of inhibition so what are the two types of inhibition one is reversible inhibition the other one is irreversible inhibition and most of the pharmacological agents that we choose belong to reversible inhibition type because we don't choose irreversible inhibitors reason being if there is any toxicity you will not be able to reverse it so we choose pharmacological agents in such a way that they are all reversible inhibitors and if you look at reversible inhibition there are three types of reversible inhibition first one is competitive inhibition second one is uncompetitive inhibition and the third one is mixed inhibition so tell me what are the three types of inhibition competitive uncompetitive and mixed inhibition and one of the special types of mixed inhibition is called as non competitive inhibition okay so don't ask me why have you not mentioned about non competitive inhibition because that's a sub type of mixed inhibition about which i will tell you now okay so let's try to understand what happens in the case of these three types of inhibition so to start with about competitive inhibition normally when there is an enzyme in the absence of any inhibitor when there is an enzyme enzyme reacts with the substrate to form enzyme substrate complex and this enzyme substrate complex breaks to form enzyme and product this is what is happening normally now what is a competitive inhibitor a competitive inhibitor is a substrate analog do you all understand this a competitive inhibitor is a substrate analog so it competes with the substrate to go and bind to the free enzyme and it forms enzyme inhibitor complex yeah in this case the probability that the substrate binds to the enzyme is reduced so the probability that enzyme substrate complex is formed is reduced so the probability that a product is formed is reduced so here the mechanism of inhibition is just a reduction in the probability in that case can you tell me what will happen when you increase the substrate concentration all of you answer this what will happen when you increase the substrate concentration the substrate will win the competition over the inhibitor the probability that the substrate goes and binds to the enzyme is more the probability that the product is formed is more so by increasing the substrate concentration you will be able to overcome the competitive inhibitor's effect do you understand this by increasing the substrate concentration you will be able to overcome the effect of a competitive inhibitor if you are able to overcome the inhibition can you tell me what will happen to vmax yeah somehow you are overcoming the inhibition so tell me what will happen to vmax vmax will remain unaffected do you all understand this vmax will remain unaffected vmax will be normal but to reach that vmax you have to increase the substrate concentration so tell me what will happen to km i said km is a substrate concentration at half maximal velocity here you have increased the substrate concentration so km is increased got it so vmax remains unaffected but km is increased 
This you will see in a line weaver bird plot. So tell me, I want all of you to be active in the chat box. Uh, there is no shortcut to memory, it is just repetition. So repeat it along with me. How do you draw a line weaver bird plot? What is drawn along y axis? 1 by v along y axis. What is drawn along x axis? 1 by s along x axis. What will you get? You will get a straight line. And if you extrapolate the straight line, the straight line cuts the y axis at what point? It cuts the y axis at 1 by b max. And it cuts the x axis at minus 1 by km. So if this is the line weaver Berg plot which you have just in the presence of enzyme without an inhibitor. What will happen when there is an inhibitor? Are you all there? Why am I not seeing any answers in the chat box? Please answer. So what will happen in the presence of a competitive inhibitor? In the presence of a competitive inhibitor, Vmax remains unaltered. Right? Vmax remains unaltered. What will happen to KM? KM is increased but 1 by KM is decreased. If 1 by KM is decreased, this is where you will have it. So if this is the line that you see, yeah, if this is the line that you see in the presence of an inhibitor, that tells you that it is a competitive inhibitor. Why are you saying that it's a competitive inhibitor? Because you see that even in the presence of an inhibitor, Vmax remains the same, but only 1 by Km has reduced or in other words, Km has increased. So that tells you that this is a competitive inhibitor. So do you have to blindly memorize that uh, those shapes? Line weaver bird plot, if you see X, that is competitive in a better, you don't have to do that, okay? Because uh, the main purpose of you uh, learning about all these facts and concepts is that you should be able to apply it when you become a postgraduate, okay? So, I expect all the students who are here to get into research, okay? Because research is one way uh, by which you will be able to understand so many concepts, okay? So, if you decide to get into a research, if you try to work on a pharmacological agent and you want to know what kind of an inhibition the pharmacological agent that you're working on brings about, you should be able to interpret line weaver Berg plot conceptually. Do you all understand this? So this is about how to interpret it. What is it? We have to, yes, more came. Good. Now, this is all about competitive inhibition. So, what did I tell you about competitive inhibition? In the presence of a competitive inhibitor, Vmax remains normal but Km is high. Now, what does an uncompetitive inhibitor do? Now, normally enzyme reacts with substrate to form an enzyme substrate complex. Thank you, Nishita. So, enzyme substrate complex that breaks to form enzyme and product. Now, what does an uncompetitive inhibitor do? Uncompetitive inhibitor binds with enzyme substrate complex. It does not bind to the free enzyme. Uncompetitive inhibitor binds to enzyme substrate complex forming enzyme substrate inhibitor complex that does not allow the product to be formed. Do you understand the difference? Competitive inhibitor binds to the free enzyme. Uncompetitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex. In this case, do you think increasing the substrate concentration will overcome the inhibition? How much ever you increase the substrate concentration, all of that will form enzyme substrate complex. And all these enzyme substrate complex will form enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. What will not be formed? Product will not be formed. So in the presence of an uncompetitive inhibitor, increasing the substrate concentration cannot overcome the inhibition. If you are not able to overcome the inhibition, tell me what will happen to Vmax. Vmax will be low, right? Vmax will be decreased. And as far as uncompetitive inhibition is concerned, I want you to remember that both Vmax and KM are affected parallelly. Vmax is decreased and KM is also decreased. Do you understand this? Vmax is decreased, KM is also decreased. Do you want to know why KM is decreased? Yeah, why is Km decreased? Because in the presence of an uncompetitive inhibitor, this enzyme substrate complex is diverted to form something else. So in this equilibrium, one side of the equilibrium, the concentration is always kept low. If one side of the equilibrium, the concentration is always kept low, the equilibrium will try to get shifted to that side. And to form enzyme substrate complex, enzyme and substrate will now react more avidly. 
enzyme and substrate react more rapidly in the sense affinity is increased when affinity is increased km is decreased so as far as uncompetitive inhibition is concerned i want you to remember parallel shift you know that in the presence of an uncompetitive inhibitor there is no way you can overcome the inhibition so vmax is low and km is also low have you all understood this so this you will see in a line weaver berg plot so all of you again tell me how is the line weaver berg plot drawn 1 by v along y axis and 1 by s along x axis you get a straight line the straight line cuts the y axis at 1 by v max it cuts the x axis at minus 1 by km so if this is the graph that you get in the absence of an inhibitor what will happen in the presence of an inhibitor in the presence of an uncompetitive inhibitor v max is low so 1 by v max will be high km is low so 1 by km will also be high so if you connect these two lines do you see parallel lines yeah do you see parallel lines so on a line weaver berg plot if you see parallelly shifted lines and what is your diagnosis your diagnosis is uncompetitive inhibition okay so uh, means yes another site it does not bind to the substrate binding site some other site so tell me what happens in the presence of an uncompetitive inhibitor both vmax and km are low okay now what is a mixed inhibitor so usually enzyme reacts with substrate to form enzyme substrate complex that breaks to form enzyme and product what does a mixed inhibitor do as the name suggests the mixed inhibitor binds to both the free enzyme and the enzyme substrate complex yeah mixed inhibitor binds to both the free enzyme and the enzyme substrate complex so what is not formed product is not formed in this case do you think increasing substrate concentration will overcome the inhibition no so what is happening to vmax as expected vmax is low what happens to km because in the presence of a mixed inhibitor there is something else which is competing with the substrate so the affinity between enzyme and substrate is reduced if the affinity is reduced what will happen to km if affinity is reduced km is increased so if both the values get altered in the wrong direction you want vmax to be high but here vmax is low you want km to be low but here km is high so if both the values get altered in the wrong direction what kind of an inhibition is it it is a mixed inhibition okay now i am going to tell you about non competitive inhibition so in the presence of a mixed inhibition how will the graph look so the same graph which i told you 1 by v along y axis and 1 by s along x axis this is the line in the absence of an inhibitor this is 1 by v max this is minus 1 by km this is in the absence of an inhibitor now in the presence of an inhibitor what happens in the presence of a mixed inhibitor v max is low so 1 by v max is high yeah km is high so 1 by km is low so if you see a line like this yeah if you see a line like this this tells you that v max is low and km is high immediately what will be your answer both the values are altered in the wrong direction so your answer should be a mixed inhibition okay so that's all about mixed inhibition now a special type of mixed inhibition is called as a non competitive inhibition and as far as non competitive inhibition is concerned i'm not going to get into the details because this involves a complex differential calculation i'm not going to explain that all that you will have to know is in the presence of a non competitive inhibitor which is a type of mixed inhibition there is normal km yeah non competitive is nc right it is normal km so in non competitive inhibition km is normal and vmax is low do you all understand this normal km and vmax is low so if you draw a line weaver berg plot you will see something like this so this is no inhibitor this is a non competitive inhibitor what has happened vmax has decreased and km is normal that is norm non competitive inhibition okay so can we fill up this tabular column can you all answer this all of you start filling up this tabular column in the presence of a competitive inhibitor vmax remains normal right 
Vmax remains normal. What happens to Km? Km is increased. Uncompetitive inhibition, I said parallel lines. Okay? Yeah. If it's parallel line, Vmax is decreased, Km is also decreased. Mixed inhibition, both are in the wrong direction. What do you mean wrong direction? Vmax is low, Km is high. Non-competitive inhibition, what is normal? Km is normal and Vmax is low. Okay? So now, will you have any doubt here? So what is the right answer here? Identify the type of inhibition exhibited by X. So here I have hidden it, but in the first image it was not hidden. So what is happening here? Km remains normal. If Km is normal, what is it? It is non-competitive inhibition. Okay. So thank you all. That's all for today. Um, I'll see you again. Which one is irreversible? None of these is irreversible. An irreversible inhibitor will be modifying an enzyme covalently. Okay, none of these come under irreversible inhibition type. If it's an irreversible inhibitor, it means it covalently modifies the enzyme. Example is aspirin. Aspirin irreversibly acetylates and inhibits cyclooxygenase. Right? And um, so this is not irreversible inhibition. Will vitamin D act on bone and demineralize the bone? Also, ma'am, role of alkaline phosphatase. Vitamin D is a mineralizing hormone of the bone. Okay, it's a mineralizing hormone of the bone. It acts on osteoblasts directly. Vitamin D receptors are present only on osteoblasts. But whenever osteoblasts get activated, parallelly osteoclasts also get activated by rank ligand expression. Okay, so vitamin D directly stimulates osteoblasts, helps in bone mineralization. But whenever osteoblasts get activated, parallelly osteoclasts also get activated. So indirectly it stimulates osteoclasts. And that is how it increases serum calcium and serum phosphate levels. Okay. And alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme of osteoblasts. So in only those bone related conditions when osteoblasts get activated, ALP level will be high. Okay. And uh, that is why in multiple myeloma, do you all know that in multiple myeloma, there is isolated activation of osteoclasts. And that is why expect punched out lesions. So in multiple myeloma, though bone gets affected, ALP level will remain normal. Until a person presents with pathological fracture in multiple myeloma, ALP level will remain normal. That you should have in mind to remember that alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme of osteoblasts. Do you all understand that? Uh, example for what? Aspirin. Shortly about anaplerotic reactions. One second. I'm just looking for a space to write down. Okay, I will tell you about anaplerotic reactions. Anaplerotic reactions are filling up reactions, okay, which exist in citric acid cycle. So, one second, let, I'm hoping that it does not get stuck now. Yes, good. So, what are anaplerotic reactions? Anaplerotic reactions are filling up reactions, okay, they are filling up reactions which keep filling up the intermediates of citric acid cycle. So apart from the main skeleton of citric acid cycle, which we always learn, wherein acetyl CoA reacts with oxaloacetate forming citrate, that's a main skeleton. Apart from the main skeleton, there is a set of anaplerotic or filling up reactions which keep filling up the intermediates. For example, you have alpha ketoglutarate, which is a part of the main skeleton. But apart from this main skeleton, don't you all know that glutamate glutamine yeah glutamate and glutamine can give rise to alpha ketoglutarate so that will fill up the intermediate of citric acid cycle similarly succinyl coa succinyl coa is a part of citric acid cycle which is formed from alpha ketoglutarate but apart from getting formed from alpha ketoglutarate don't you know that bim amino acids give rise to succinyl coa yeah bim amino acids give rise to succinyl coa so that is again an example of anaplerotic reactions or filling up reactions. Hope that helps Vignesh Vishwanathan. Okay. I will discuss all the other topics in the next session. Okay. So thank you all. My best wishes. See you again sometime later.